and you don't know what it's like until you're there. When I talked this morning, I was really talking about myself. But come on, sis. Came come on. And she goes, I'm going through something. And I thought, dear God, I'm trying to get strength when I feel like I'm the weakest person in the building. And this song means so much to me. I don't know what I'm going to do tomorrow. I don't know what's going to be for the rest of my life. I don't know how I'm going to get through, but I'm going to trust in Him, Sister Norm. Come on, Sister. Yeah. That's all we can do is trust in Him. Whenever all the things are falling apart around us, when you don't know what's going to happen, you don't know who you're going to call on, you have those people, but sometimes they can be so many people you still feel by yourself. There's people that love you that you still feel by yourself. Come on now. But I'm thankful that I can trust in Him. Right. No matter what I'm going through, God says, Sister Nora, Sister Tracy, trust in me and I can get you through. So I'm going to sing this again and I don't know if I can get through without cracking up and my voice going crazy. But this verse means a lot to me. It says, truth is, I don't know what tomorrow brings. Come on now. There's not a day God yeah, hasn't seen right, already that's right. at a time. God He's help this morning. Says, Thank you, Jesus. Okay, Sister Tracy, that's what Lord you're going to go praise. through. Sister Gordon, you're going to go through more Thank tomorrow. You, we don't know what tomorrow comes, but in all things, let God be our life and breath. I don't want anything more. I don't want anything less. I want God to be my life and breath this morning. And I know that we're all going through things. Right, come but on. this sir. means so much to me. Is you know what tomorrow brings. There's not a day ahead you have not seen. So in all things be my life and breath. I want you in Lord and nothing else. When you
And uh, I believe God uses those things for our own good. I mentioned a little bit ago when I said that the lesson that Sister Tracy talked about in Sunday school this morning, that it uh, was very close in what the Lord had dealt with me about preaching, and we didn't connect in any way, and I had no idea what the lesson was about. But God knows what He's doing. Amen. That's just the beauty. That's what amazes me and uh, just blesses me in such a phenomenal way. But if you have your Bible this morning, I'd like for you to turn to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We're going to read verses 15 through verse number 18. And I'm going to read a subtext in the book of Psalm chapter number 71. We're going to read verse 20 and verse 21. If you'd like to stand for the reading of the Word of God this morning. Second Corinthians chapter number four, verses fifteen through verse eighteen. And then if you'd like to earmark the page if you got a Bible, not just a tablet, it might be easier to do it that way, but Psalm chapter seventy one, verse twenty, verse twenty one. When you have it, say amen. amen. I want to say we appreciate all of you for being here again. Welcome all those of you that may be visiting this morning. Just make yourself a at home here, this part of the family. Uh, if you're a part of God's family, you're at home either, either, either way. Uh, if you're a child of God, because you're amongst uh, brothers and sisters in the Lord, just want you to make yourself at home. Please continue to pray for my wife while she's out of town, out of state, and uh, for Miranda as well. Second Corinthians chapter 4, verse 15, beginning, the Bible said, For all things are for your sakes. That the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. For which cause we faint not. But though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal way of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. And then if you'll turn over to the book of Psalm, chapter 71, verse 20, verse 21, just going to read a subtext or tag along text here to, to what the Lord has laid on our heart to preach about. Psalm 71 verse 20 and verse 21. The Bible says here, Thou which hast showed me great and sore troubles. I want you to listen to that. Thou which hast showed me great and sore troubles shall quicken me again and shall bring me up again. Sounds like he's been here before. From the depths of the earth. God, I want you to see this morning has put David in a place that he's talking to you and me. And some of us have been right there. Verse 21. He said, Thou shall increase my greatness and comfort me on every side. With the Lord's help, I'd like to preach this morning on trouble brought me here, but grace won't leave me. Stretch your hand to the Lord this morning. Lamb of God, we love you this morning. We ask you to just have your way in this service. We pray, Lord, that you'll let the Holy Ghost come into this sanctuary, convince hearts, and begin to work and move up and down the aisles of this church. God, drawing those the need to be drawn. We pray God this morning to apply that healing balm, that salve of grace, God, upon every soul. We pray, God, that you'll just speak to us through your spirit and through your word, God. We know this morning that without you, we're not much of anything at all. But with you, we're the child of God. 
We're asking you this morning that you'll apply every strength we need to get through where we're at. God, speak to us and add the anointing of the Holy Ghost to the Word of God. Draw those that are here to the altar of prayer. We'll give you praise for everything that is accomplished in the name of Jesus. And everyone can say amen. amen. I want you to look at somebody this morning, shake a hand or two, and tell them trouble may have brought you here, but grace won't leave you. Amen. Going to preach this morning on trouble brought me here, but grace won't leave me. And you say praise the Lord for that. Amen. Amen. There is a place of comfort and sometimes arrogancy that I see a person can come to that the only thing that can bring them back to level ground is to face some troubles, some trials, and even sickness or times of physical affliction. I've met people before that it's almost as if they become so arrogant, so prideful at the place they are in their life. The only thing that will get their attention and the only thing that will bring them back down to ground level is to go through some sort of affliction, some sort of trial. For the prideful person, God has to allow a man to face a place in his life where he realizes his own inability to rescue himself from himself. For that person that may be lost, undone without God, that sinner that's been unconverted, God has to allow that man to realize how filthy that his ways are and how that it takes the blood of Jesus Christ to purify him from his filthiness. And for the backslider, God has to allow that man to realize how hard that the struggle is going to be, how hard it's going to become without God's favor and God's divine assistance before that he'll ever come back down to ground zero, down to level ground. Because if you didn't already know this, a lot of times the success that we have in life, the great things we may do that make us feel like we're somebody while we're trying to build our self-esteem, it may be a career choice, we become successful at it, we may be good at our job. We may be, you may look in the mirror, you may think, take a thousand selfies a day, look at yourself, well, I'm not that bad looking. You know, I don't know what exactly that it is that brings you to the place that you can come to. All the different little things along the way that cause you to have a lot more confidence in self than you really ought to. I'm not talking about being the type of person that you think you can't do nothing right and have no self-esteem at all. I don't believe that's of God either. But you can get to the place that you think you can get through life and you don't need God. You can get to the place that you think that you've got it all under wraps. You've got life by the tail. You don't need God. You can get to that place. But do you know this morning that when you get to that place, sometimes it takes trouble, it takes trial, sometimes it takes affliction, sometimes God has to allow things to come into your life to get your attention for you to understand just how much you need God. You may look at yourself and say, oh, I got this thing under control. I don't need God. I'm going to make my own way through life. I don't need church. I'm going to do my own thing. I don't need God's favor. I've got it all under control. And somebody said many years ago that the successful uh, rock group called the Beatles or whatever you classify their music genre as, that one of them had made a statement, whether true or not, I don't know, but it's been highly publicized that, that they were so successful that even something along the lines that God themselves couldn't take them out. And it wasn't long after that that one of them ended up dying. I want you to understand, you can never become so successful, you can never become so high and mighty that you cannot fall flat on your face. The minute that you turn your back on God, the minute that you turn away from God, is the minute that you're going down a path of destruction. What blows my mind, but yet breaks my heart, is the many times as a pastor serving the Lord over the years of my life in God that I've watched people that God does something 
thing to get their attention. He allows something to happen in their life. Or he does something. And yet they serve God for a little while. And then when some time passes. Then they turn their back on God again. And then they just run the other direction. And don't serve God at all. You see the same tragedy that caused you to realize. Uh, that your, your need for God. The last time. Uh, in the next time you have a storm come. It might be worse than the last thing that you went through. Or you might not even make it this time. Can I tell you this morning that if the grace of God is good enough to try to get your attention, you ought to be internally good enough to say, I'm going to serve God regardless of how popular that it may seem, regardless of what anybody might think about my life. Do you know there comes a time in your life where you've got to do this thing called grow up? It's only two words, but it takes a whole lot more than just two words to accomplish. It's called grow up. There comes a time in your life uh, that a man has to be a man uh, and a woman has to be a woman. Uh, there's a time in your life uh, that you understand. I can run with friends. I can spend time trying to be popular. I can try to be the coolest kid in town. Uh, I can try this or try that. I can try to be the, a drug lord in my, in my neighborhood or, or my county. I might be so drunk that I don't know what to do with myself. Uh, I got friends that are laughing at me and everything else. Uh, and all of this is fun and cool and everything else. Uh, and I tell you, there won't be anything cool about one day in the fire hell. Won't be one thing cool about that at all. Say amen, somebody. But there comes a time in your life uh, that you got to get a grip on yourself. There comes a time in your life that you got to look in the mirror and say, if I keep going down the road that I'm on uh, when I'm 50 or 60 years old, where will I be? It's a crime shame that you got people that are 40, 50, 60 years old still trying to act like they're 18 or 25 years old. There comes a time when you got to grow up. Say man, I can tell you this morning uh, if it takes a heat wave from heaven, if it takes a trial, if it takes a time of drought, emotional depression, God will do whatever he has to. God will allow whatever has to happen in your life uh, to get your attention. Can somebody say man this morning to me. You see, God will do these things uh, to get our attention. Sometimes God allows trials. Uh, if you're a parent or a grandparent or maybe you're a victim or you've been guilty yourself and you have ever saw that God allowed something to happen in somebody's life uh, to get their attention, raise your hand. Has anybody here you ever seen God allow something to happen in a person's life to get them to see their need for God, uh, to understand Honey, there's some things a lawyer can't get you out of. Honey, there's some things a doctor can't make you better of. Honey, there's some wounds and some hurts that mom and daddy can't heal. And then it takes the grace of God. There comes a time in your life that if you have to understand your need and your dependence on an almighty and a divine God, honey, he's more than the man upstairs. He's the great God of heaven. Heaven is his, come on, heaven is his throne and the earth is his footstool. And you might put God on the back burner, but he's still there. You might run from God today, but he's still there. You may not go to the house of God, but God's grace is still there. He's an omnipresent God. You can't run so far and you can't run so wide and you can't run so long that you run away from the grace of God. All you gotta do is look at Jonah. It didn't matter how far that he ran. God said, son, I know where you're at this morning. Somebody say, help us right here today, God. But I can think of no clearer understanding than what Paul, that great apostle who had lived a life of sin, but God had turned his life around. If anybody could have bragged about the unrighteous things that he had done, he could have. But Paul had a great conversion on the Damascus Road when God had an intervention and God showed himself to Paul. Paul, he was Saul right then, but God got his attention. I'm praying this morning, God, get the attention of those uh, who have running from God. God, get the attention from those uh, that are kind of going running the other way. Get 
Give the attention of those that are backslid. Give the attention of those that are lost. Give the attention of those who won't give you their attention. Can somebody say that? But Paul, he clearly showed us in his writings here in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 4. I read to you there. I just want to look at it, pick away at it for just a moment. But in verse number 15, he said, For all things are for your sake, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. You see, thanks that we were brought through it. You see, whenever you give thanks because of what you've been through, many times it ain't thankful that you're hurt. It ain't thankful that you were broke. It ain't thankful that you were sick. It ain't thankful that you lost a loved one. But it's thankful that I got through it. You see, when he said we we're thankful that we are bring we are bound through the abundant grace of God and through all of these things we faced, I'm not glad about the fact that I got high and I couldn't even hardly control my own self. But I was thankful that God got me home. I'm not thankful that I got so drunk out of my mind that I didn't even know what I was doing. I don't even remember the ride home. But I'm thankful looking back that somehow that the mercy of God got me back to the front door and got me in the bed that night. Can I tell you this morning, you might face all the flames of hell, but thank God this morning that we serve a God that will get you where you need to be because it is abundant grace and when it's over with you should be thankful say amen I feel the Holy Ghost this morning verse number 16 he said for which cause we faint not but though our outward man perish yet the inward man is renewed day by day you hear that we though we faint but he says, but for, he says, through our, our outward man perishes, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. These troubles, these trials, these afflictions we're going through. Brother Billy said this woman, sometimes we bring it on ourselves. Whether you brought it on yourself or whether you didn't bring it on yourself. And I tell you, when it's over with, God can get your attention and get the glory when it's over with either way. But though we are exhausted and taxed, our soul, through the midst of it, can get stronger. What are you going through right now? What have you been through the last couple of months? Come on. Well, I've been through an atomic spiritual bomb. Amen. I've had everything hell had it feels like unleashed on me. I hurt so bad there were times I wanted to cry and couldn't even get a tear out. I felt numb because I was in so much pain. Well, let me tell you this morning, those things that come to try you, those things that come to hurt you, those things that come to afflict you, sometimes in the end, it has a greater reward because while I am fought on the outside of the fact that, it, that my family acts like they don't love me no more, your own spouse may kick you to the curb. Your own family may act like you don't even exist. Nobody may come to your rescue. And nobody may even care that you have a problems or struggles. It may seem that way whether it's true or not. But let me remind you of this this morning. Even in the midst of my trials, I may be on the outside. I may cry. I may hurt. I may weep for a night. But joy comes in the morning. Did somebody hear me? Weeping may endure for a season, but joy comes in the morning. Somebody give God glory. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost. Amen. But these things that come against us, he said, our, our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding way to turn away to glory. Do you know this morning that the things that you go through to you, Sister Tracy talked about it this morning, they seem like the biggest, baddest, worst thing you've ever been through. Yeah. Come on, come on, every time. Yeah. 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 Every storm is the worst one I've ever been through. Yeah. Every financial difficulty is the worst thing we ever face. Huh? Yeah. This is the worst one I've ever dealt with. Yeah. Isn't that the way it is a lot of times? But whether it's the worst or not, God said, I light affliction. Yeah. Now, he used a man of God to say that a light affliction it is just for a 
stay moment. It didn't come to stay. It came to pass. You think that this little thing is going to be around for a little while? But God said that affliction. It didn't mean that your circumstance won't last forever. He said the affliction from the circumstance. I lied affliction. He said, but it's for a moment. But he said it works for a far more exceeding eternal weight of glory. You know what he was saying? Uh, our temporary trials can bring us to a much greater reward. Uh, you can't see it now. You can't feel it now. And all you can see is hurt, circumstance, pain, trouble, and everything else. Uh, but next month or next year, you might be the most dedicated child of God in the Great Street Church. Uh, you might be obeying God, doing greater exploits than you've ever done. Why? Because the trial brought you to a place that you got deeper. He said in verse 18, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. But the things which are seen are temporal, but the things that are not seen are eternal. Do you understand this one? The greater reward is possible, but only when we are focused on the future. If you sit around and think about what's going on right now, you may even get to the place that other people have been to. And take your own life. It's all quiet. Can I preach just be myself here this morning? A few days ago I was talking to somebody who was working with me. And he told me about a young man in his twenties, I believe. I've seen him on a few occasions. Looked like a typical young man living it up, doing his own thing. Come to find out that young man would often turn back into drugs. And I think his drug of choice was crack cocaine. He would fight within himself. He's had times of getting free temporarily, trying to get off the drug. Well, him and his girlfriend, pregnant girlfriend, having problems. And in the midst of all that, he relapsed and went back to the crack cocaine. They tell me that what ended up happening was this young man got under such guilt condemnation feeling so helpless that he just couldn't seem to get his act together he rode his bike a long way to a relative's house he went inside and said man I messed up I need help supposedly this relative kind of chuckled at him thinking he was just fooling around the relative got up and went to the restroom and while he went to the restroom this young man saturated with guilt and condemnation walked out the front door of his house. A man that was scared of heights climbed up in a tree took his belt off, wrapped it around his neck wrapped it around a branch and jumped off and hung himself and killed himself. Never even got to see the child that his girlfriend was with. Never even got to see it. Why? Because I can tell you that the load and the weight of sin is a heavy load to carry on your shoulders. And the life of sin is a vicious cycle. Say amen. I remember many years ago I heard Brother Don Rich, a great preacher and a man of God. He preached a message that I'll probably never forget on sin's long trail of tears. And he preached a message about a young boy. And this was many years, many, many years ago. And uh, this young boy had got involved in one of these street gangs. And they were doing their thing. And one day, they, the initiation for that young man was to do whatever that gang told him to do. Well, they had taken a woman off the street. They bound her and gagged her. And they told that guy to be able to be 
be a part of the street gang. What had my memory served me correct is that he had to rape this woman who was bound and gagged. Her face was covered with whatever they had over her. And so this young man to be a part of that gang, he raped this woman, uh, had his way with her. And then when it was all over with uh, and he thought everything was fine, uh, they reached down and pulled off that thing they had on the face. And lo and behold, it was his own mother. Amen. He, he got under such condemnation and guilt. Uh, the building that he was in, he ran up every flight of stairs to the top of the building and threw himself off the top of the building and killed himself. You see, the reason is, uh, is that sin ain't nothing to play around with. Uh, the Bible said, can a man take fire into his bosom and not be burned? Uh, you can't toy around. You can't play around uh, with sin and not expect to never be burned. Uh, and I tell you, there are countless people that thought they had it under control. It's a pill here, a pill there, a bottle here and a bottle there. It'll be okay. I under control, then I tell you sin's got a long trail like that preacher said of tears why? because it leaves a great trail of pain behind it leaves a lot of scars it leaves a lot of hurt it breaks up homes it destroys marriages it destroys self esteem it destroys everything in its path come on Somebody raise your hand right now. Say, God, help us in the name of Jesus. I'm telling you this morning that this thing that Paul talked about, these afflictions, these troubles, sometimes they are brought on by your own doing. Sometimes you can be along for the ride because of what somebody else did or just everyday life. But you see, what I see the Lord showing us this morning is that sometimes we can get just far enough away that God says, all right, if you won't listen to me, have it your way. You're already on your feet. You want to help me this morning? Brother Billy, come here for a second. Brother Steve, come here if you don't mind. My brother, Brother Benefield, come here. I just want you to help me just for a minute. Just stay right there, Brother Billy. If I this morning was a representative of you and me and what we face in life every day, stay right over here. There are times at church revival. I go to church, get a few goosebumps. I may get a little bit over here closer to the Lord, drawing a little closer. Maybe not even quite where I need to be. But then I go back out on Monday morning and some of the things of this world, they're pulling at me, pulling me the other direction and what have you. Come stand right here, Brother Steve, if you will. And so, I've used this illustration many different times. I want to take it just a slight different angle. But all the while, the Lord just keeps on trying, just reach out. He's trying to get a hold of you. Sometimes he may get his fingers around you and all of a sudden you break his grip to go do your own thing one more time. But that doesn't stop the Lord from trying. He reaches out. He's trying to get a hold of you. He's trying to get your attention so many times. But yet you turn and you do your own thing. There comes a time that how God has kept with God's grace. God, I don't know if he does it with his angels or whatnot, but he holds back. And he stays the enemy. Those demons, those imps that try to come against you. I told somebody here a while back. They, man, they're going through a bad situation. I said, oh, you better pray for that person. Why? Because the moment that the hedge is removed, if they think it's bad now, and the favor of God is removed, we better pray for them because they are in real trouble now. Because the Lord is able to simply just look over just nod your head. And at that point, come on over here, Brother Benfield, and Brother Steve, and grab a hold of one side of my arms here and start pulling. Start pulling different directions. And everything's getting worse and worse. I'm getting pulled on this side, pulled on this side, and my life is turning into an absolute total shipwreck. Pulling me. Pulling on me. 
everything. I can't get no peace in my mind. I lay down at night and I can't seem to get any peace. I try to go throughout the day and there are people that will try to medicate their pain and their problems by finding somebody just as bad off as they are. Somebody with just as much problems. Somebody that believes like they believe. Somebody doing like they're doing. And if that person agrees with it, makes you feel all right about what you're doing. Keep pulling on me. But all the while, God looks over. He says, Son, I tried to get your attention with this thing over here. I tried to get daughter. I tried to get your attention with that thing over there. But you wouldn't yield to me. And so, I've removed that hedge. And I've allowed trouble to bring you to where you are this morning. You can be seated. Trouble has brought you to the state of mind that you are in right now. Right here in this service. Saints of God, you pray for this preacher this morning. There's a place that you can get to that you're way up here. And God says for me to bring you back down to where you need to be. I've allowed some things to happen in your life. And that's what God's trying to tell somebody here this morning. But I want you to look at the psalmist. And what the psalmist said in our subtext. He said, Thou which hast shown me great and sore troubles shall quicken me again and shall bring me up again from the depths of the earth. When I first read that church, I thought to myself, did David just see problems around him? Had God just allowed him to see bad things happening? Was that what he meant by you have showed me things? But then when I read the latter part of that, Sister Nora, I was convinced. God didn't just walk through the day on Thursday or Friday and say, look over there, David, see all that junk? That God allowed David to experience it firsthand. Why do you say that, Brother Myers? Did you hear what he said? He said, you have, he said, you have showed me great and sore troubles, but you shall quicken me again and shall bring me up again from the depths of the earth. You see, David is a man that he messed up in his life. David says, you showed me sore troubles. You showed me what it feels like to walk without you. You showed me what it feels like to lay down at night and hope that I wake up the next morning because I know that I'm not right with God. I know my heart's not where it needs to be. You showed me great and sore trouble. But I believe in you right now. You're going to bring me up again. Brother Billy, he didn't just say, look at what so-and-so's going through. But he showed him. In other words, he removed that hedge and he let David go through some junk and some troubles himself. And in the midst of it, he said, but I believe within myself that you're going to raise me up again. I believe you're going to get my attention. I believe you're going to help me through this thing. I believe when it's all over with, it's going to be better. Even he said this to the, to the church, to you and me. Thou shalt increase my greatness and comfort me on every side. You know, when you fall away from God, your reputation suffers. Your name suffers. And you feel lonely. And you feel empty. And I don't care how many trips to the club, trips to the dance floor, trips to the crack house, trips to the therapist, trips to wherever you go to medicate your pain. It ain't going to fix it. I said it ain't going to fix it. But what did David say? <laughs> Woo, hallelujah. He said, Thou shalt increase my greatness. Why? Because in the midst of David's ridiculous decisions, his reputation began to fade. 
his name began to begin to be mud. They began to hear about what David did and how he'd done. But he said, you're going to increase my greatness. And he didn't stop there. But he said, and comfort me on every side. In other words, all this loneliness, this emptiness, I call up best friends. Maybe if I have somebody to talk to, it makes me feel better. But when your friends ain't there, you can't get a hold of nobody, and you sit all by yourself, and you're as lonely as what? The Lord's using David's situation. And David said, you're going to use all this I'm going through to bring me up again and make my name great again. And you know what else you're going to do? You're going to comfort me on every side. I'm not just going to feel a little bit comfort up here on the left. I'm going to have comfort on every side. Everybody else may walk off and leave me by myself, but you are going to comfort me. I don't know if you're getting a hold of what I'm telling you this morning. I don't know if you're feeling what I'm saying. Uh, but I can tell you, you've ever been in a place of trouble where you feel so empty and by yourself and all alone. Uh, and you get to thinking about how He is going to comfort you on every side. Do you know this morning, there, if I was to take a poll, I guarantee you that there's nobody here that would want to spend not even one day in prison. A little six foot by eight foot cell bumped in with somebody else. you got to turn sideways just to get past the beds to the toilet while they watch you use the bathroom many other crazy things you've got to deal with as a prisoner. But you're locked in a prison cell. I saw a documentary the other day of a woman that made one split of a hair of a decision. A woman that probably by all reason was not a bad person, but one you know, sometimes, folks, you can only be like just a hair of just one little decision that takes three seconds to make. And now she's in prison for the rest of her life. She messed up her kid's life. She messed her family up. Everything over a split-second decision. You know what she did? The cameraman was following her. She went over to a locker. A little locker that looked like something that I used when I was in high school. About that wide, about that tall. She's fiddling with the locker, whatever on it. She says, all of my possessions are in this locker. I was thinking to myself, I got that much junk in a bin on a shelf in the garage that I forgot's even there. I got so much stuff, I could probably have storage units to put some of it in. But her life has been reduced. And you know what she did? I don't know why I'm preaching this. Somebody needs it. I didn't even think about this before I came to preach this morning. She opened up that locker, and she said, this right here is the most sentimental thing that I have left of my name. And you know what she grabbed? A stack of pictures. And as she started thumbing through them, this is my son. This is my daughter. She won't talk to me anymore. This is this person and this person. His hot tears are flowing down her face. You know, that woman spends every day of her life in a prison cell. And I can tell you that's one of the most lonely places that a person can ever be is in prison. Do you know? You may never spend one day in a jail or a prison, but be locked away in a mental prison every day. How do you know? I've spent a few days in that one myself. But I'm glad to report to you this morning that I know somebody that even if he has to allow a storm to blow through, when it's over with, he said, if you'll yield to me, he said, it'll be better than it was before. 
you're here this morning, you fall away from God, you do your own thing, you do whatever you feel what you want to do, or you're not as close as you one time was, let me tell you something. Sometimes in the aftermath, I feel the Holy Ghost here this morning. If I've ever felt the Spirit of God, I feel in this morning. In the aftermath of what you face and the problems and the troubles that you go through, do you realize sometimes it's just at the right moment of your life for God to do a complete overhaul in your life? Are you in that place this morning? Ready for a complete overhaul? So I'm tired of the path I'm on. If I, if I keep going like I'm going, I'm not going to be anywhere different. I'm not going to be doing anything different ten years from now than where I'm at right now. Here's what you have to understand. If you look over, I believe it was Alabama, a year or two ago, I saw where these great, I don't know if they were tornadoes or hurricanes, I think it was tornadoes, just absolutely ravaged entire cities and leveled, I mean places, it looked like a city dump. But do you know something? When they began to pull themselves together, they began to account for all the aftermath of what it was. They start sorting through the pile of trash from yesterday's problems. And you know what they did? <coughs> Buildings that were some of them were probably half dilapidated. By the time it was over with, they began to build. And you know what they did? They built brand new schools. They built brand new shopping plazas. Brand new stores. Brand new. Brand new. So sometimes we think, well, I'm too much of a mess. God can't do anything to me. If you only understood all the crazy things I've done, places I've been, things I've said, I guarantee you can't be much worse than the Apostle Paul. That by, by his own charge, his own words, that Christians were martyred and put to death. But in the aftermath, you begin to collect the pieces. God says, I am going to take your life. I'm going to rebuild it if you'll let me. And I'll build better and greater than it was in the first place. Can you say amen? Stand your feet. I'm going to tell you two little quick things. And we're going to dismiss. I feel the Spirit of God convicting my heart to close here in just a moment. I want you to listen to me for just a minute here. All throughout the Bible, we are told stories. We read about apostles and men of God. We read about rabbis, bishops, and just common ordinary people who turned away from God. Those that backslid. Those that turned away. Those that drifted. Some that wanted to serve idols and serve God. They wanted a 50-50 relationship with God. Those sorts of things. But all throughout the Scripture, Brother Billy, I read stories of people who drifted away. And God allowed something to happen to get their attention. I mentioned it earlier, but I'm going to tell you one of the greatest stories recorded in the Bible. Some of you may not know this. You may learn something this morning. One of the greatest revivals recorded in the Word of God of people turning back to God was the story of Jonah and Nineveh. You see, this man Jonah has one of the greatest revivals. Why? Because it was God's plan. But you see, over 600,000 people turned back to the ways of God. If you go back and read the Scripture, they were putting sackcloth and ashes on their animals. They were so humbled by the fact that God was going to bring judgment that they lay their life down before God and repented. But I want you to know something. These people turned back to God. But when Jonah was faced with trouble in the belly of a whale, God took that whale to get that man's attention. Trouble brought me here. But grace won't leave me. Trouble has brought all these things, you know. But here Jonah is 
Fish is swallowing him up. Giant whale swallowing him up. Jonah's got a decision to make. Do I want to stay here or do I want to do God's will? Trouble got Jonah's attention. Jonah decided, I'd rather serve the Lord and I'd rather do the will of God than to be in the fish's belly. And whenever he made up his mind, God had that whale spit him out on the deep shore. You know what? I can see Jonah. I've joked around about it. The other church cracked up laughing at me, but I'm looking. I'm seeing a man covered with fish, steak, guts, seaweed, and everything else. Come, You go in a fish's gut like a whale, you're not going to come out looking pristine like you just took a bath. And, uh, you know, that stuff you put, that uh, sanitizer stuff, you sure ain't going to look like that. Jonah come out of that fish's belly, and I can see Jonah, a different changed man. He's made up his mind. Going to do the will of God. He comes out of that fish's guts out on the beach shore. He takes off running. He's headed towards Nineveh. And if I'm, my memory serves me correct, it was like a six or an eight word message. He didn't preach a whole sermon. Just like a six or eight word message. Repent. And he told them what to do and everything. And a whole entire nation. Because one man faced trouble. And trouble brought him, brought him to the place that grace was able to give him deliverance. 600,000 people made up their mind. I'm asking you this morning, as a mother, as a grandparent, how many people that love you and have confidence and respect in you as a parent or a grandparent or somebody that they just respect a lot, how can you affect a person's life by simply saying, I'm tired of the trouble. I believe I'll turn to God. And those that are watching your life can say, every time my mama faced trouble, every time my grandmother faced trouble, it might have been really bad, but grandma didn't never turn her back on the Lord. I've seen grandma get mad, throw things across the house. Come on, let's be real. I've seen grandma get mad, lose her cool, slam the phone down. Let's get real. Huh? I've seen grandma fuss and carry on. But there's one thing about it. Whenever grandma got done fussing and carrying on, and humility struck in, she said, oh, the Lord is going to help us through this. I want you to know this morning, some of you are in a place this morning that trouble brought you to. But grace will not leave you there if you don't want to be there. Sister Tracy's coming to the piano this morning. I just want to remind you this morning, you don't got to walk out the doors of the church the same way you walked in. You can walk out of this church this morning free indeed. If you're here this morning and you're sick in your body, you can walk out healed if you want to be healed. If you're here this morning and sound lost, I'm not saved, Brother Myers. You can walk out of here saved. I'm going to tell you something. It's easy for you to give in to some kind of thing, some kind of temptation, something pulling at you. And you do something you know you shouldn't do. Well, you can look at yourself in the mirror and say, boy, I sure have messed up. I've done some things I know I shouldn't have done. And God would not be pleased or happy with me. But you know something? You can stay there or you can say, I'm not staying there. The choice is yours. As every head is bowed, eyes closed across this church this morning. I'm getting ready this morning. I want to give you an invitation for you to make things right with God. As heads are bowed and eyes are closed, I want to remind you that it does not always have to be a sin issue or backsliding. There's a story in the Bible about a palsy man who was carried, the Bible said, born of four in a cot. He couldn't help himself. Four men took a man who had trouble that by all accounts was no fault of his own. Trouble brought him to a place where he couldn't even help himself. The four men carried him to the rooftop, led him down to the tiling of the roof right in front of Jesus Christ himself. And a man that had a sick problem Jesus not only healed his sickness, but he said, Thy sins be forgiven. Trouble brought him there. The grace didn't leave that palsy man right there where he was at. The 
Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Saints and God are praying. Some are coming to the altar this morning. I want to give you a direct invitation. God should never have to beg you to receive Him, to accept Him. If you feel intimidated by coming to the altar, at least find your place at your pew. Stop worrying about what people think. I can tell you this. The Lord is a comfort and a strength and a help in the time of trouble. If you're here this morning, you say, Pastor Myers, I sure could use a touch from God this morning. If that's you, will you come right now? Will you kneel at an altar, saints of God? Will you come and help these that are in the altar pray? If you're not praying, I want to encourage you to find somebody to help them pray this morning. You never know what battle somebody's facing. You never know what hardship that they're going through. You never know what pain that they're dealing with and have bottled up inside trying to put on a plastic smile like everything is okay when things really are not okay. If that's you, I'm encouraging you, please don't stay there. Trouble may have brought you there, but grace won't leave you. Come on, pray right now. Oh, yes, Lord. God, I'm asking you to show mercy, love, and compassion to these that are in the altar. I'm asking you to reach out a hand of love right now. If there's anyone that understands what I'm going through, if anyone understands my fears, my pain, if anyone understands, Lord, it's you. Sister, you just give it to the Lord right now. Everything that's been bothering you, every failure, every fall, every shortcoming, God, I put it on this altar right now. God, show me mercy, Lord. Lord, that you would revive me, rebuild me, renew me, God, right here this morning. Trouble may have brought me here. The grace won't leave me. Oh, Lord. Lord, I don't want you to be silent another day. Speak to me, God. Lord, I pray that you'll raise me up. Revive, renew in Jesus' mighty and holy name. What will you do? What will you do? to receive that touch. Will you be willing to reach out to Him? Will you be willing to confess your sins before Him and say, I know that I've sinned. I know that I have done wrong if you're here this morning and you know you're not where you need to be. The first thing you ought to do is start off by saying, God, I'm sorry. God, you know what I did the other day. You know what I said last week. You know how that I've done some things that are not pleasing, but Lord, will you forgive me? God, would you wash my sins away? Would you cover my soul with the blood of Jesus Christ, which is able to redeem mankind? God, I want my heart to be right. I don't want to lay down my pillow at night wondering whether or not I'm where I need to be with you. I don't want to lay down at night trying to go to sleep and find a way. Thoughts that I know that I've done wrong. Oh, it may feel good for a moment. I can tell you this. No preacher that I know has ever told anybody that there wasn't pleasure in sin. But the Bible said the pleasure of sin only lasts for a season. Folks, we're talking about something eternal. The soul that never dies. Why would you feed your soul with temporal pleasures when eternity is on the line? Eternity is on the line. I'm turning away from temporal pleasure. And I'm turning my heart and my life over to an eternal God. I'm asking you to help my lost family. I'm asking you to help my friends, oh God. In the name of Jesus. Lord, I praise you. God, I'm asking you right now. To touch us in the name of Jesus. Lord, I pray God touch my brother. Lord, would you have mercy? Would you forgive me? Lord, you know where I stand on. Oh, sometimes trouble may get me in a place where I feel empty, where I feel torn, I feel weary. But grace, grace will not leave you there. 
Come on, he loves you more than you even know right now. You feel so worthless. Come on, I know how it feels to feel like that. You feel so empty. You feel